welcome to Warping Fist. Everyone knows the stories of the various so-called super criminals who've been treated here, but that is only half the story. Our low security wings offer normal but troubled individuals a safe haven for recovery. Our website contains everything you need to know about our facility and how we can help you. <laughs> Batman Arkham Asylum is by far the most influential third-person action-adventure game ever created. It possesses a unique quality that sticks with you long after the initial playthrough. The game's captivating world design, addicting combat mechanics, thrilling stealth gameplay, and epic boss fights are just one of the few aspects that contributes to its memorable experience. In a market flooded with sequels and first-person shooters, Arkham Asylum captured attention, especially considering the reputation of superhero video games at the time, which was not exactly stellar. Batman in particular had been stuck in a cycle of mediocre tie-in video games for years, but Arkham Asylum defied expectations and emerged as a critically acclaimed title of the late 2000s spawning one of the most successful gaming franchises ever. The behind-the-scenes story of Arkham Asylum's development is fascinating, featuring ambitious plans that couldn't be fully realized. The evolution of key gameplay features and unused character designs that hint at the game's original darker vision. So how did a relatively unknown indie studio create such an incredible experience? despite their limited resources. Hi everyone, I'm Warping Fist, and today we'll delve into the history of Batman Arkham Asylum and explore the intriguing journey that led to its creation. Sit down, grab some Kool-Aid, and relax, because this is gonna take a while. During the development of Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, Warner Brothers would approach EA and offer them the license for Batman in gaming. EA would accept and task Eurocom to develop a tie-in game based on the film, and they would be fortunate enough to view concept art from the upcoming movie along with having voice performances from many of the film's cast. Batman Begins was the perfect culmination of the games that came before it. The gameplay was inspired by Ubisoft's formula for stealth action adventures, which was present in Batman Vengeance and their popular Splinter Cell franchise. The combat was a lot more fluid and detailed, with players being able to mix different combo combinations. The Batmobile driving sections had better controls and the stealth gameplay was also heavily expanded upon, giving new players more options for sneaking around the map. Batman Begins was an ambitious project filled with developers who cared deeply about creating a fun experience for gamers. They set out to create a game like no other in graphics and gameplay, and it seems their efforts paid off relatively well as Batman Begins was met with decent review scores upon its release. It was a step in the right direction, and the gameplay required a few more tweaks to reach its full potential. With this in mind, Warner Brothers would hand over the gaming license to Elevation Partners, who tasked Pandemic Studios to begin work on their next tie-in game, which would be an adaptation of the Batman Begins sequel, The Dark Knight. Batman The Dark Knight 
would officially begin development once the creative team received the concept art for the film. Initially, the game was envisioned as a linear project, just like Batman Begins. They would work on an early prototype using PS2 hardware, with plans to expand to newer gen consoles once development fully kicked off. And kicked off it did, as once the creative team received the first batches of concept art from the Dark Knight, they would be awed by the scope and vision of the film, so much so that they became more ambitious on how to approach their tie-in game. Instead of a linear experience with curated maps, encounters, and dedicated Batmobile segments, the game would now take place in an expansive open-world Gotham City, with players being able to either glide through the map or traverse using the Batmobile and Batpod, according to Gary Oldman. The video game, I saw a tiny little piece of it. They're trying to get it so that when he's gliding, that it's a sort of, there's a feeling in it that you've never really felt before, that the game doesn't stop and start. They're trying to build it in to the, to the system, almost like watching the film. Sure. That it's a continuous thing. Um, but I mean, I'm on the rooftop. I mean, my figure just stands there with the backlight. I don't do it. I don't do anything. I'm really boring. I go, you know, Batman, we've got to get out of it, you know. And he goes and dives off the building. I'm Jim Gordon, boring Jim Gordon on the roof. Using a new engine codenamed Odin, used in another open world game from the studio, Pandemic Studios began transferring all their assets from the Dark Knight game into this new engine to support their ambitious project. However, this decision led to some significant problems, as when they brought over assets like Batman, the map, and other NPCs, it caused the game to either drop to absurdly low frame rates or crash the game entirely. It did not help that the game also seemed to be incredibly glitchy and unresponsive. This was a disaster, which meant that months of work would be for nothing, and the engine they were trying to use was not compatible. Many assets were created, and they tried to fix and work around the technical problems. EA, who had taken over as the publisher at this point, would attempt to salvage the game by bringing in a hundred new developers. Still, despite all their effort, it was becoming clear that they couldn't get the game in a presentable state, at least within their limited time frame, leading to its cancellation, and EA ultimately losing the license for the character. After EA lost the license for a Batman game, Warner Brothers began looking for a new publisher, and the company Eidos was the one that caught their attention. While they were making a deal with them to license their next Batman game, another studio was working behind the scenes to formulate a unique and fresh approach to the Batman IP with the help of another major publisher backing them up. Day One Studios developers of the game Fracture became interested in creating a Batman game after discovering that Warner Brothers was looking for a fresh new title and would begin work on a game based off the comic Gotham by Gaslight. They would create a prototype for the game with a working model of Batman, NPCs, enemy models, and an open world Gotham City. Batman Gotham by Gaslight would have been an action adventure game where players must investigate Jack the Ripper and use their many gadgets to traverse a gothic and creepy Gotham City. And based on the evidence and controller layouts, it's clear that this Day One Studios Batman game was meant to be a third-person shooter akin to Uncharted, and players would be offered many tools and gadgets to bring death to the combat. Day One Studios would approach and show the prototype to the publisher THQ in order to convince them to get the Batman gaming license from WB. Unfortunately, THQ failed to get their hands on the license, as WB had already given it to IDOS. This led to all the assets and code for this Gotham by Gaslight game being deleted forever when the company went out of business. Check out my video on the Lost Batman third-person shooter for more information about this intriguing Batman project. Link in the description or the top right-hand corner.
When Eidos received a license for Batman video games, they approached a new and little-known studio by the name of Rocksteady Games, who had only developed one project at the time, Urban Chaos Riot Response, a first-person shooter released for the PlayStation 2 and original Xbox. The game did decently well in terms of sales and reception, and after its release, they were keen to develop their next game on next-generation hardware like the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. While they were developing prototypes for their next project, IDOS would become impressed about their work and requested they present their ideas for a next-generation Batman game. After Rocksteady pitched their ideas, IDOS approved of their ambition and development would begin on the game in late 2007. Unlike most Batman games before, which were adaptations of previous comics or films, Batman Arkham Asylum had the luxury of being a new universe and story. The creative team had the benefit of formulating a unique and original story for the character. With this in mind, they would approach writer Paul Dini to help craft the narrative of the game and he agreed to become involved because he was also excited about the opportunity to create something fresh and different. They took inspiration from many seminal Batman stories like The Dark Knight Returns, Long Halloween, and especially A Serious House on Serious Earth, which inspired the aesthetic and setting of the game. To add even more validity to this brand new take on Batman, the animated series veterans Mark Hamill, Kevin Conroy, and Arlene Sorkin would be brought in to provide their voices again, helping Arkham Asylum to become one of the most definitive takes on Batman. Ah! You won't find Mr. J. He's in the secret lab of the gardens and oh crap! Yep, I know. However, the writing and voice performances would ultimately mean nothing if they could not nail the visual aesthetic of the game. I think there's a level of intensity in Arkham Asylum that has been lacking from other video games. In Arkham Asylum, it's the real world, and he's fighting real thugs and real killers, and people really do get killed in the game. It's a very, very scary world, but it's a world that he's perfectly suited for. In Batman Arkham Asylum, we really wanted Batman to face the worst night of his life. And so by taking him to Arkham Asylum, the home of the supervillains and where they are all kept, we really could take Batman and challenge him in so many varied and different ways. You're in this kind of dark universe where you're not entirely sure of anyone's motives. From the very first cinematic, uh, when I saw the picture, it became really clear just how dark this was going to be. We wanted to create a game that was in a dark, gritty environment, and Arkham Asylum really lends itself to that. Location and the kind of mood that every Batman fan really wants to play a game in. When we started the project, that we wanted quality to be you know, paramount. It had to be paramount because people love the characters. We wanted to do something that took from every great visual interpretation of Batman. So even though it doesn't look a lot like Bob Kane, you might see a little bit of uh, you know, a hint or a throwback to him. It isn't solely the Wildstorm look. There's a little bit of Neil Adams in there. There's a little bit of Frank Miller. We just wanted to get something that gave the coolest visual interpretation of Batman and his enemies. The world of Batman takes on many appearances depending on which story you source from. Rocksteady's game took major influence from a serious house on serious earth. It only made sense for them to craft their game around the iconic setting of Arkham Asylum. Sure, Gotham City was a location that may have been played around with, but considering that this was Rocksteady's first venture into a Batman game, it was far too ambitious to go straight into an open world game. Instead, Arkham Asylum would be a more open area experience. Players can explore almost the entirety of Arkham Asylum, including the surrounding island. This allowed Rocksteady to give players the feel of roaming around an open map without having to dedicate resources to a world they couldn't even support. The creative team separated the building into distinct wings and locations to add visual flair to the asylum, each with its own visual style and unique atmosphere like the more modern security wing, filled with high-tech technologies, modern architecture, TV screens all over, and large machinery. The medical wing, which took on a more Victorian-era aesthetic and enhanced the horror factor of the asylum, the industrial and brickwork sewer sections, botanical gardens, and the gothic aesthetic of the administration building. All these map elements combine to make Batman Arkham Asylum 
one of the most visually stunning video games of the time. I'd even argue that it still holds up today and never fails to impress more than 10 years after its release. It's to the point where sometimes I wish there were more areas to explore within the asylum for us to dive deeper into its captivating history and unravel the secrets tucked away within the decaying infrastructure. And it seems like at least early on, that was a major possibility. Unfortunately, like many other games during early development, some map locations had to be cut from the final product due to time constraints, pacing, or budgetary issues. Areas like the secluded lighthouse connected via a wooden bridge. It's possible that the lighthouse was just used as set dressing and was never meant to be an explorable section. However, since there is a detailed illustration of the building's interior, it seems it was considered as a gameplay area early on. What the player would have exactly done here is unknown, but we do know that you'd have to grapple to the top as the spiral staircase seems to have fallen apart. We can see this lighthouse in the final game, but unfortunately, you cannot visit the building as it's completely separated from the main map and now exists as mere set dressing. Another area seems to have been explorable but was ultimately cut from the final game was a section called Chapel Rock. Separated from Arkham via a large bridge, the area included many key locations like a massive graveyard for the inmates, a large chapel, crypts, the Twisted Willow area, and a steep winding pathway leading to the lower shore of the island. Unfortunately, we have no clue what this section of the map was used for or what characters would have been present, but with how massive the area is, it's clear that a major story mission must have taken place here for a good chunk of the game, but likely due to time constraints, this area was cut from the final game and likely merged with other pre-existing locales. Yet another area that could not make it into the final product was a large children's maze. The encounter would see Batman trying to traverse the maze, guided by Poison Ivy, until he reached the center where the Mad Hatter would be waiting with a cup of tea. This area is not in the final game, however, references to this sequence exist in the game, such as Poison Ivy guiding you through the asylum and a Mad Hatter easter egg present in the botanical gardens. There existed another boss locale, but unlike the Mad Hatter boss fight, a version of this area did make it into the final game. This artwork depicts an alternate design approach to the second scarecrow encounter in the mansion and clock tower. While the clock tower aesthetic is present in the final version, it is much more pronounced in the concept art, even to the point of seeing industrial piping and a massive clock tower in the distance. The most interesting element of this map is how Scarecrow is approached. In the final game, he's a giant that searches for Batman, but in this concept art, he appears like a traditional Scarecrow, which makes me wonder how they would have approached the game over screen. Taking a closer look at the design they were going for, Scarecrow here is meant to appear like an industrial and steampunk version of a traditional Scarecrow design with many pipes leading out of his body, which are meant to appear like a ribcage. Unfortunately, many of these areas could not make it into the final product, but their exclusion allowed for developers to expand the existing levels in the game. The game may have allowed for exploration around most of the island, however, the development team still made sure to guide the player to where they were supposed to go through smart metroidvania style level design which locked off certain sections until players acquired a certain gadget or reached a certain point in the story, helping the world feel organic and complex. Interestingly, some concept illustrations of Arkham during the game's development makes the facility look more fantasy-like. Some may even argue that Arkham looks a bit like Hogwarts with how it appears. I wouldn't blame you as it does give off an aura of childlike wonder and sensational architectural design you'd find in a children's novel. Despite this, we know that Arkham Asylum was never intended as a child-friendly game, so this art was likely trying to capture the absurdity of the Batman universe and was not a hint 
of the game's early tone or atmosphere. I think it's clear that the original envisioning of Arkham Asylum was significantly larger than what we got. The map was so large that Rocksteady considered making the Batmobile drivable in the game, similar to how Uncharted The Lost Legacy allows you to drive a car. Despite the fact that the game was not open world, but the map was big enough to justify it. However, Rocksteady was a small studio under heavy time constraints, so they did not have the resources or time to implement a larger map or the Batmobile into the game. The final look for Arkham Asylum is amazing. I humbly applaud the team for what they managed to put together. The Asylum is filled with so much history and attention to detail that you can't help but be engrossed in its lore. It's the type of immersiveness that no other Arkham game has been able to match. Don't get me wrong, I love soaring above the streets of Gotham, but something is refreshing about returning to Asylum. Its smaller scope helps you connect to it better, and it feels like every floor tile, brick, broken glass, or derelict building tells a story of corruption, and every easter egg to Batman's villains and even obscure stories is a great way to show the players both your love of Batman as a character and flesh out the universe to a monstrous degree. I equally love the collectible items like the villain audio tapes and the Soul of Arkham tapes as they really provide more depth into the characters, the history of Arkham Asylum and just makes the world feel so much more alive. Hello, my name is Dr. Gretchen Whistler. Do you understand me? Yeah, I hear you, bitch. So when's dinner? I'm getting hungry. Designing characters is one of the most important but stressful elements of crafting a new Batman universe. Batman and his mythos have such iconic designs that trying to reinvent their looks will of course be a daunting task. John Granvado and many other artists attached to the project understood this very well and would begin work on this new envisioning of Batman and his mythos of characters. According to John Granvado, the overall vision for the world was to be grim and realistic. They wanted the world of Arkham Asylum to be dark, menacing, and terrifying. The character designs reflected this idea very well. Of course, when we're talking about a Batman universe, Batman himself is the first character we have to talk about. And believe me when I say his early looks were very fascinating. Initially, the artist gave Batman an entirely original and unique design. Unlike the final suit, which embraces a more traditional black and gray color scheme, this early concept of Batman was all black, likely influenced by the Nolan Batman suits. To contrast and balance out the blacks, Batman's utility belt and bat symbol are shining silver, and in this design, the silver bat symbol is small and seems to also function as a pin that keeps his large enveloping cape in place. That's the thing about this version of Batman's look. He appears more guarded and mysterious, a ninja hiding within the shadows. This approach is made even more apparent by his overall slimmer build. This design for Batman fits in with the tone and style of the game and was genuinely a remarkable original look for Batman that would have made the suit instantly recognizable to fans. Unfortunately, this suit design would never be used, as I assume the creative team wanted something more familiar and closer to the character's source material. This would eventually lead to the artists adapting this design, a look meant to pay homage and stylistically borrow from Jim Lee's illustrations of Batman, who was more muscular and had a more traditional Batman outfit. Borrowing from this design, you'll notice that many of the suit's illustrations looked similar to Jim Lee's depiction, with very few design alterations. The final design we ended up getting was the perfect combination of armor and fabric, creating one of the most iconic Batman looks in media, and we have to thank the plethora of different design approaches for inspiring and informing the final look. Of course, Batman 
was not the only character to receive drastic design variations during the game's development. Since the world of Arkham Asylum was meant to be grim, it's not surprising that one of the most terrifying Batman antagonists would have very unsettling designs. In these illustrations, the Joker has one of the most grotesque looks in the character's history. This design was meant to be horrific, making anyone who saw him feel uncomfortable. The most noticeable aspect of this design is the large Glasgow smile cut into his mouth that has reached all the way to his forehead. It would have been simple enough to have this Glasgow smile as a noticeable scar, but the artists went above and beyond to make us as unsettled as possible. As you can see the large stitching pattern holding his smile together like some kind of Frankenstein threatening to expose his grotesque injuries to the world. And unlike most iterations, he seems to be devoid of his red lipstick. Instead, the red on his mouth appears to be his infected decaying skin, which is further hinted at by his black lips and gums, clearly showing his lack of hygiene and disinterest in a well-kept appearance. Just a few more cuts into his smile would be enough to have his entire face peeling off. And honestly, I think this Joker would not mind since the Joker here seems to be in some kind of crazed trance. In every illustration, his mouth is trapped in a permanent smile as drool slobbers from his mouth and his eyes are always trapped in a haunting gaze as if he cut off his eyelids, permanently being stuck with bug eyes. Like a mad dog, he's embraced his insanity to a whole new degree to the point where he's decorated and modified his straitjacket into a makeshift Joker suit. This Joker design represents one of the most terrifying looks for the character, taking influence from Heath Ledger and Dave McKean's artistic depictions. Ultimately, this look for the Joker would never be used in the end as the creative team opted to embrace something tamer that took inspiration from how the character appeared in the seminal story Batman the Killing Joke. Every Joker illustration from now on borrowed from this look but with a few notable differences. For one thing, the Joker appears to be wearing a hospital gown matching Harley Quinn's outfit. Another difference was his heavily scarred mouth which they were still embracing at this point. However, eventually after a couple more concepts, we'd end up with the final look, which pays homage to the character's comic appearance, while still looking unique for Rocksteady's universe. Of course, Batman and the Joker are not the only characters to go through redesigns during the conceptual phases. Characters like Scarecrow and Killer Croc also looked very different in the concept art, but overall, their difference in appearance is nothing major and appears to look very close to their final designs, albeit with minor or medium differences. Well, except for Bane, who seems to have been given an entirely new mask, we've never seen on the character that sort of looks like the one from the new Batman adventures, and it definitely fits in with the more grounded and dark universe the developers were trying to create. Harley Quinn by far has the biggest design difference among the side villains. Her outfit is significantly more revealing, now sporting torn pants and a torn inmate suit with revealing cleavage. The character still maintains her white face paint, black eye makeup and eye cover. However, her ponytail design is different and is now dyed white and black, like a deck of cards. The look they went for in the final game is still revealing, but not to the extent of the original look. It also maintains the character's original color scheme from the animated series. There are plenty of other characters that unfortunately could not make it into the final game, but luckily we do get a glimpse of how they may have appeared, especially Mr. Freeze, who was considered for the game early on but was cut because his motivations did not align with the Joker's plan.
So whether it's on the big screen in The Dark Knight or on the small screen with Lego Batman, the Cape Crusader has undergone something of a critical resurgence in recent years. I'm hoping to continue that trend at Rocksteady Studios here in North London, who are working on a game that's already being touted as one of the blockbusters of 2009. Arkham Asylum began development in 2007, and since games often require time, to create many of the assets. Placeholders are often used until the final models are complete. Sometimes the developers change a design mid-production due to the shifting of the creative vision. Because of this, the user interface and specific character designs look very different depending on which build of the game you're looking at. This is especially true for Batman Arkham Asylum as the early 2007 build of the game features a different bat suit design, which as you can see, is low poly, unfinished, and has an entirely different bat symbol. Based on how incomplete the suit appears, it was used as a placeholder until the final textures were complete. Based on another illustration of this suit, they were playing around with giving the suit an enveloping cape. We do have a good idea on how the final completed suit may have looked like. As you can see, the suit looks heavily protective, with armor plating placed all over the suit. The cowl also appears to look identical to the final game, but with the addition of a noticeable chin strap, the suit appears futuristic, and many of you would connect it to the Arkham Knight costume, as they do look very similar in their design language. However, the look of the bat suit harkens back to these early concepts. Not only is the bat suit armored like the one in the model, but you'll notice that the suit has the same ab design, the same utility belt, nearly identical shoulder pads, the checkered fabric underneath the armor, almost identical cowls, and both suits also seem to have a circular glowing device on Batman's right gauntlet. The only difference is that one is blue while the other is red. There are two interesting details about this early armored bat suit. One, it is not a separate suit, but a series of armor pads that Batman placed on top of his pre-existing suit. Each armor piece is said to be incredibly durable. The armor is said to increase his durability, attack strength, power of his gadgets, and physical capabilities like jumping. The second detail is that this bat suit has capsules on the bat belt, which according to the art, would have been grenades of some kind. This may imply that the smoke bombs were included in the game early on. Unfortunately, for some unknown reason, this suit was ultimately cut from the game, but the suit does still appear in some form in the final product as the armored suit. This suit cannot be used in the main story, but can be worn during the challenge maps, and all it does is give the player additional armor, a far cry from what it could do early on. The suit itself does not look that different from the 2007 build, except for the bat logos, which are entirely different. With the aesthetic and characters of Arkham Asylum now being decided, it was now time to develop the core gameplay mechanics, something that would cause many headaches for the developers involved. It's now time we focus on the most crucial elements of Arkham Asylum, its core gameplay features. This section will explore three key gameplay categories, combat, stealth, and detective work. Detective work holds immense significance in Batman's mythos, as the Dark Knight is renowned as the world's greatest detective. Thus, it would be a glaring missed opportunity to not incorporate this into a Batman game. Arkham Asylum attempts to implement this feature through dedicated gameplay segments. Players activate Batman's detective mode and scours a confined area for vital clues. Once a specific detail is scanned, Batman follows a trail to a particular location. The detective segments in the game are serviceable, adequately fulfilling their purpose. While this feature is not flawed, when compared to future implementations, its lack of death becomes apparent. Thankfully, the same cannot be said for other aspects of Arkham Asylum, 
mainly the combat mechanics. You don't have much time to do anticipation moves. If you need to jump somewhere, it does need to be instantaneous. You can't have a long anticipation and then jump because it has to be quite responsive for the player. They need to be able to press the button and it needs to happen straight away. So we've got quite a big challenge there. With the combat system in Batman, we really went back to basics and tried a lot of different things because we really wanted to get that feel of being a superhero. It's really important to us that when you pick up the pad, Batman, if he's taking four, five, six henchmen on, he doesn't have a lot of trouble. I mean, he's a highly trained martial artist, so we really wanted the player to feel that power. So the skill in the game really comes from when you're taking on eight, nine, ten enemies, one with a taser, one with a machine gun, one with a pipe he's ripped off the wall, and balancing that danger in the room. Batman is known as a master of combat and is experienced in many fighting styles and has the right moves to deal with every possible situation. Due to this, he's often portrayed as an unstoppable force with very few characters that can match him in sheer skill. And it seems the same can be said for developing his combat in games, as often his combat in games follows a beat-em-up style structure that developers of Arkham Asylum wanted to avoid going this route as they felt it did not portray Batman as a force to be reckoned with. Rocksteady wanted Batman's fighting style to be fast and chaotic, but easy enough for players to get a hang of without being too easy. At first, the combat was inspired by rhythm games, where once a player enters a combat encounter, the camera would enter a 2D view and players would have to match buttons with colored projectiles, similar to games like Guitar Hero. The system was unique, but the developers felt that it was too isolated from the rest of the game and did not organically fit in with the experience. With this in mind, they would tweak the mechanic and create what is known as the Free Flow Combat System. The Free Flow Combat System relies heavily on fluidity and rhythm. Instead of locking on to one enemy, Batman darts to the next, creating a sort of flow hence the name Free Flow Combat, to incentivize players to keep this motion going. A singular enemy can only stay up with three punches before they are knocked to the ground, forcing players to move on to the next while countering enemies that often try to attack. To add depth to the system, the player is offered a plethora of different moves like combo finishers, combo throws, a quick grapple move, and many more. But let's be honest, only the combo finisher is actually useful. There is also a plethora of different enemy types, who all require different strategies to take on, such as the ones with stun batons, who cannot be attacked directly, but only from behind. The titan enemies, who are tanky and require multiple attacks to take down. And the knife-wielding enemies, who cannot be countered and need to be cape stunned. One fun fact about the combat system is that the lightning bolt indicator that shows up when an enemy is about to attack you was not added until a few months before the game released, perhaps implying that early test players had a hard time maintaining a combo without it. Interestingly, certain enemies ended up being cut from the final game. These enemies are the straight jacket henchmen and the titan lunatics. The straight jacket henchmen was said to be nearly identical to the traditional lunatics. However, this time, they would be armed with blunt force weapons. This likely means that the character would have been erratic with his movements and would try to grab onto Batman and stab him with the knife. Perhaps these enemies would run at Batman, attempting to tackle him, similar to the traditional lunatics. However, these enemies would have to be evaded through jumping out of the way or jumping right past them, meaning that they would be one of the few enemies with the red indicator at the top. The enemy may not be present in the game, but they do appear as an easter egg in the medical facility. Another cut enemy type was the Titan Lunatic. As the name suggests, it was a titanized version of the Lunatic enemy type, who would have likely tried to constantly tackle Batman or grab him and slam him to the ground. 
When we looked at how Batman would take down a number of armed enemies, we really kind of, I guess, the standard route to go would be to introduce a sort of stealth mechanic. But we thought that would make Batman feel really weak and scared of the enemies. And that's not what Batman is. He's a predator. He preys on these enemies and he preys on the fear of these enemies. We looked at introducing what we called the invisible predator mechanic. Now, this mechanic allows Batman to move around in the rafters of a building without the enemies even knowing he's there. And he can study where they're moving and choose when and how to take them down. And that whole kind of preparedness of Batman is a really important part of his character as well. We've got two distinct kind of gameplay modes and we want to achieve, with one of them, we really want to achieve a feeling that you're creating fear in the enemies, that you're really having an emotional impact on them, that they're reacting to the fact that they can't see you and you're Batman and you really are picking them off and, and kind of playing with them. Of course, Arkham, but not purely rely on combat to pad out its runtime and needed other gameplay segments. To add a bit of variety, this is where the Predator stealth mechanic comes into the picture. The stealth system, dubbed the Invisible Predator mechanic, takes up a good majority of the game and it was meant to showcase Batman's ability to hide from his enemies and take them out individually. As a mechanic, the system works perfectly and is a nice change of pace from the game's heptic combat and annoying detective segments. Like most games featuring stealth gameplay, they often involve the player being trapped in a room as gunman searches for Batman. However, unlike many games, Batman is given many tools to make his gameplay unique. For one thing, there is so much verticality to the levels, with players being able to grapple to high vantage points to scope out enemy positions and plan out their strategy. You can either do a stealth takedown, which is quiet but also painfully slow, meaning that you can be discovered at any moment. You could also opt for a quicker route by using a regular takedown. These maneuvers are a lot faster, but keep in mind they are loud and attract other enemies towards you. The system is well thought out but also pretty basic. Luckily, the game offers many options to take out goons, ensuring you'll always have a diverse experience with every encounter. A stealth system needs pretty smart AI to make it engaging. So the developers implemented a fear system into each enemy encounter, a similar mechanic from Batman Begins and is primarily inspired by Eternal Darkness's sanity system. Once Batman began taking out each goon within the map, the goons would become more scared, which caused their AI to shift. They would be more erratic and turn around randomly, making stealth more stressful. While not as engaging as other games that purely build their gameplay around stealth, the Arkham Predator system is still fun to play around with and never feels like the segments overstay their welcome. Now that we've gone over the core gameplay mechanics, it's important to bring up the supplementary gameplay features that directly affect the gameplay and bring additional depth in regards to combat and stealth. Arguably the most popular additional feature in the Arkham games and is essentially a foundation and integral to every core gameplay feature is the detective vision, a mode players can enter allowing them to highlight important critical points or pinpoint the locations of enemies, with the most dangerous armed goons highlighted in red. The system was inspired by a similar mechanic in the Metroid games. This allows players to see their skeletal figures. The detective vision, which was called investigation mode in the game's early beta, allows for a full 360 view of the map and it's become so engraved into the experience that most can't imagine playing Arkham Asylum without it. Admittedly, the feature is pretty brilliant and I found myself using it at least every three minutes, especially when it comes to stealth. I don't think anyone at this point will deny that Arkham was a historical gaming franchise in terms of its impact on the action-adventure genre. 